Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope everybody's okay today. I'm on holiday and uh, just doing uh, some relaxing stuff, really. Um, so hope everybody's okay and love to everybody out there. Um, so we're looking at the historical reliability of the Gospels and we're going to look at uh, contradictions in the Gospels and how to uh, deal with them or any so-called historical mistakes. I've uh, done on my channel uh, today, uh, if you go to the Jason Burns channel, I'm working through a book uh, called, uh, called The Cambridge Companion to Jesus. And in one of the videos there, I go into um, Quirinius uh, census. So that's with here. Uh, but we look at Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 13. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gassines, and the herd, numbered about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. Um, the issue here is, when it says the other side of the sea, it's located um, quite significantly away south of the Sea of Galilee. It would have taken 37 miles uh, before these animals would have gone into the sea. So the question is, has Mark got the historical information wrong? Uh, we read in Matthew uh, 28, and when he came to the other side of the country of the Gadarenes, Matthew seems to place the event in Gadara um, as Mark puts it in Gerasa. Uh, Gadara is about seven miles from the Sea of Galilee. Um, I'm just going to quote um, McGrew here because it's quite quite in depth. He says, there are seg several significant variants in the Greek text of Mark chapter 5 verse 1 and the parallel text of Matthew 8.28 and Luke 8.26.27. In Mark and Luke the best attested reading is Garcines, an attempt to represent the adjective corresponding to the place name. The Aramaic version of the place name would be written without vowels Gerasa equals G-R-S or K-R-S. As we look at the map, the identification of the region of the Gerasenes in Mark with Gerasa, modern day Gerash, is doubtful. A plausible identification is with Kerasa, modern Kersi, in either case from the root K-R-S on the eastern shore where a steep hill runs down almost directly into the water. So what about Gardines? It seems probably of Matthew's Gospel either misspelled the term uh, Gardines or mistook it for Gadarenes. Much as someone might mistake or mistakenly correct Ostemo for Ostego, the copyists of manuscripts are not immune to making errors or a spelling or to fixing what they are copying if they think it's a spelling mistake. Uh, so that's the answer to that. Um, that's in uh, McGrew's uh, notes. So then, um, if we look at Mark chapter 731, then he, Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. Question, why would you go north to south?
if you look at the map, um, there's a mountain, Mount Maron, which is a quarter of a mile high directly between Tyre and the Sea of Galilee. But there is a pass from Sidon uh, which goes in the mountain to the Jordan River Valley where foot travelers to where people go and travel to Galilee and find fresh water for the journey. So basically if you'd look at the map of the area you'll find that Mark's text is verified. Mark chapter 11 verse 1 Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethany and Bethany at the Mount of Olives Jesus sent two disciples. Uh, critics would say anyone approaching Jerusalem from Jericho would come first to Bethany and then Bethphage. Several passages showing that Mark knew little about Palestine. We must assume, uh, Dennis Neenham says, that Mark did not know the relative positions of these two villages on the Jericho Road. Randall Helm, who wrote the Gospels, 1997. As we look at the verse again, now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. If you notice, the Gospel of Mark states, when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came first to Bethphage, then to Bethany. It, it, what he's doing is he's giving an approximation. Um, McGrew says where it was on the road that Jesus sent his disciples on ahead. Bethage and Bethany were both on the eastern slopes of the Mount Olives, about half a mile from one another. So basically, you read the context of the text. Uh, objection 10:12. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Uh, skeptics will say what, this. This sentence is generally regarded as an addition to Jesus' teaching that was made to address situations relating to Rome legal practice whereby a woman would initiate uh, divorce proceedings. John R. Donahue, Daniel J. Harrington, The Gospel of Mark, Volume 2. Uh, this is completely contradicted by Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, 18, chapter 18, verse 5 and 4, says Herodias took it upon herself to confound the laws of our country and divorce her first husband in order to marry Herod Antipas. Checkmate. Basically when you're looking at the Gospels check the historical and cultural context. Um, slaughter of the innocents um, in Matthew chapter 2 the infants killed because of Herod uh, argument why is it not mentioned uh, it couldn't have happened uh, basically these are arguments from silence and most historians don't use arguments of, from silence if they do they use them in a very qualified sense uh, arguments from silence are stock and trade of skeptics yet if they if you was to use it against them they soon call you out uh, yet they use it all the time. Um, so those are some uh, possible issues concerning historical accuracy with the Gospels um, that McGrew tackles um, and um, from silence uh, and Herod and killing and the slaughter of the innocents. I mean, if you actually read Josephus and you go and listen, read his life, uh, you'll be amazed uh, what you read. I mean, he killed one of his relatives, uh, had a young lad uh, swim in uh, a lake or a river, and then because the guy was a possible heir to the throne, uh, Herod had him killed by one of his men. Um, Herod knew no bounds. In his last days, he ordered uh, a number of people to be slaughtered before his death, but his commanders didn't take, uh, didn't obey his command. Um, the guy was a lunatic in the end of his days. He was uh, absolutely ruthless, and he, the idea that he, that he 
could not or would not or did not kill these children. Um, to me, uh, the, the evidence points to him being quite capable of having children killed to serve to save his own neck and also that was a practice of um, rulers in the ancient world if you look at the whole history of uh, Greek uh, uh, sorry gr yeah Greek and Egyptian and Babylonian history of kings <laughs> many of them uh, had no qualms in having family and uh, opponents killed and especially uh, children if they were going to be a, a threat to the to the throne and uh, so there is uh, historical parallels there is uh, indirect evidence that Herod uh, would have been a s um, and I think that um, you know we should give the Gospels the benefit of doubt there I don't think they have to use uh, point the argument of silence to skeptics on that one. Those are my thoughts. What are yours? Uh, I've got one more video now, um, so I'm going to make the last video, then I'm going to call it a day. So I'm going to go on now to my last video, and I hope that you find this a challenge and a blessing. Uh, before I do, I'm going to recommend you some books that you can read about this topic. So, I am uh, just finding some books for you to read uh, on this topic. Okay, um, the first book uh, to recommend is The Historical Reliability of um, the Gospels. Um, Uh, so this is um, the historical reliability of the Gospels. Um, and this is um, this is Blomberg. Um, so that's. Um, So, yeah, so, sorry, good. So you have uh, the historical reliability of the Gospels by Craig Blomberg. Um, then you have the historical reliability of John's Gospel. Um, so these are books that you can get that would be a help to you. Um, evidence for God, uh, 50 arguments uh, from the Bible, uh, William Dembski and Mike Lycona might be a, a help to you. Um, just look here.
This would be an interesting book to read. Hans Hank Hanegraaff has God spoken proof of the Bible, divine inspiration. Um, Jesus and the eyewitnesses, not specifically on um, on the topic of historical reliability of the Gospels, but still very helpful. Um, so I'm just looking at some books. A uh, good commentary on the Gospel of John there by D. A. K. Um, so, just looking at stuff that you can read. Uh, just seeing what I can find. Uh, that that'd be interesting. Craig A. Evans, Life of Jesus Research, Analytic uh, Bibliography, but it's not on the topic in hand, but would be very interesting to read. There's one of my favourite theologians just of the subject, J. C. Burkhart. Um, Dutch reform guy. Uh, and There's a book to read against what uh, we advocate. Uh, Robert M. Price, The Incredible Shrinking Son of Man, how reliable uh, it, you know, is the information. So that's a scholar against what we believe. So it's always good to read around. Uh, Making Sense of the New Testament is a good book you could read by Craig L. Blomberg. Uh, so I'm just seeing what... See... It goes here. you got Jesus and the Gospels is another good book by Craig Blomberg. Um, a good resource dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels that's for those who are interested in uh, scholarship very good dictionary there uh, lots of articles on the new scholarship today I wouldn't agree with many of those articles in there um, Cambridge Companion to the Gospels again would not agree with a lot of what we're sharing in these talks but I'm sure it would be very good. I'm reading the Cambridge Companion to Jesus. You'll be able to get this free on PDF. Uh, so I'm just looking at what else is there available. Seeing a. Uh, The Historical Jesus of the Gospels, uh, Craig S. Keener, be very good to read, uh, quite a deep book. Um, so let's see what, uh, just trying to find. Um, Good book to read spiritually would be A Harmony of the Gospels by John Calvin. So that would be this one here. Uh, Calvin is one of my, if not, 
at Harmony of the Gospels by Oliver E. E. Daniel might be interesting. Uh, there's an old classic, uh, Brooke Fuss Westcott, Introduction to the Read. Um, R.T. France uh, is a good scholar um, on Matthew. William Barclay's books, he's, he's not an inerrantist, he's a liberal, uh, but they're some of the best commentaries that you can read on the Gospels. Um, so, um, yeah, he's a liberal, like, doesn't believe in literal miracles, or didn't believe he's dead now. But um, William Barclay is a really good writer. I use him a lot in sermon preparation and Bible studies. Uh, because he's he's, a, he, he's brilliant in Greek and he's brilliant in producing words, uh, so he's really really good. So if you want to study the Gospels, have a read of William Barclay. I don't endorse his attack on the Bible as the Word of God, but um, he's certainly helpful. Richard A. Burridge is uh, a notable scholar. Um, I'm sure this book would be very interesting to read. Uh, it's been principally uh, quite influential in the scholarship of the Gospels recently. Uh, but um, again, Craig Blumberg, the historical reliability of the Gospels. If if anything, you read through my recommendations it would be this book historical reliability of the gospels that that would be the book to read um, so let's just see what else there is so there we are so we'll do some more um, book Uh, book recommendations. Um, another day, so there we are. Hope you uh, got that as a blessing. So, so I hope you uh, were blessed uh, by just thinking about possible issues, whether the Gospels are historically reliable. And uh, give you uh, some books uh, to look at. So, Um, so we're just going to think now, um, I think I'm going to go on uh, to just talk about, we've looked at possible historical data that might not be correct in the Gospels and we just considered a bit of that. So uh, I've done a series or some uh, videos on inerrancy and the Gospels. Um, ground so we'll just cover it a little bit now um, <coughs> and 
<laughs> I think after this we're going to do um, we're going to do uh, a video on Herman Bavinck <coughs> the life and theology of Herman Bavinck uh, I think that's what we're going to do after this um, so there we are So we're looking at are there uh, contradictions in the Gospels? I've done work on this myself. 2 Peter chapter 3.16 There are some things in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do to other scriptures. Uh, and we're just going to look at Bart Ehrman. It says the source regarding Jesus' resurrection I hope was contradictory as we can see by doing a detailed comparison of the accounts of the Gospels, Bart Herman, The Historical Jesus, 2000, page 90. And there are many, many objections that can be made. Um, And uh, we'll, we'll just look at one. Uh, was Jairus' daughter already dead? Matthew 9 or just dying? Mark 5. Okay, so we'll just look at one because it's going to get complicated. Um, Frames website. Uh, you'll be able to find Poitras' book on inerrancy of the Gospels, and he goes into detail. Uh, about inerrancy in the Gospels and sorts out the contradictions. Also, if you go on to the uh, website Christian Think Tank, he has an excellent uh, article on contradictions in the Gospels and resurrection accounts, and he does a brilliant article showing you how these issues can be resolved. So that's Christian Think Tank. Look, in, look at contradictions in the resurrection accounts. Uh, that will be a brilliant article to read. Okay, uh, but in Matthew chapter 9 verse 18 it says a ruler came in and knelt before him saying my daughter has just died but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. In Mark chapter 5 22, 23 it says then came one of the rulers of the synagogue Jairus by name and implored him earnestly saying my little daughter is at the point of death come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Just a point here that if you go to John Frame's website, uh, type in John Frame, Christian philosopher, and you'll find his website. And he shares the website with Poitras. Uh, and if you go onto the free book section, you'll find Inerrancy of the Gospels. And you'll find Poitras give a brilliant expose of these two passages, just uh, an aside. So we see that Matthew says that the daughter is right there and then died and in Mark it's Jairus says is it the that his daughter is at the point of death what we see is math in his account the mark it's a compressed piece of information if we look at Stein, Blomberg and Witherton, um, in the standard of contemporary writing uh, of events, uh, compression was often used as a way of writing and would not be seen as a contradiction. Uh, quote, this is uh, McGrew According to Chadwick, Matthew's expression, has died even now, is so close in meaning to Marx at the point of death that a person full of anxiety might say she is dead by now and mean what we would express by saying she is at the point of death. When he left his eyes to seek out Jesus, quote, I that she was in the process of dying. In his appeal to Jesus, he may well have used words that expressed his fear that the worst had already come to pass. 
Uh, I would add that I think there is some uh, truth to the way writers use compression in the time in the first century. I think that uh, is accurate and important. But I would also say that um, Matthew and Mark have two different um, two different ways of looking at the situation, two different um, what can I say? Two different agendas in the writing. Matthew is more looking at it from a Jewish perspective, Mark from a Gentile perspective. Um, that's why the Matthew account is more simple because he's not homing in on the Gentile significance whereas Mark being Gentile, looking to Gentiles is expanding it more so that's why you see the differences that's why you see the nuanced differences just a, a little pointer that, that Poitras brings out in his book so, um, so there are a couple of reasons around the so-called contradiction that you can give there. Um, here, Greek grammar, uh, literary context, uh, etc. Okay. Now we could go into others. And it'd be it'd be too detailed. If you go to alleged contradictions of the Gospels by Dr. Timothy McGrew, go and listen to his lecture. you of contradictions that people bring up that uh, he answers in a very detailed way. So I'm going to finish now and I'm going to go and I'm going to do uh, a little video, a video on uh, one of my theological heroes, Herman Bavink, and then I'm going to finish. Okay, so I'll be back in a few minutes if you want to come and listen to my uh, reflections on Herman Bavink.